Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the February Wellness Webinar. My name is Laura Maloof Miller. I'm a Senior Health Education Specialist with HealthNet. Today's webinar, Keep the Beat, Live Heart Healthy. The information provided in this presentation is intended solely for the general information of the audience. It is not medical advice and shall not replace consultation with your physician or other qualified health provider. If you have any health-related questions or problems, please seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about today in the webinar, the structure of the heart and how it works. I'm gonna review some of the heart disease statistics. I'll also discuss heart disease and the major risk factors, modifiable risk factors, and other contributing risk factors. And for each of the risk factors, I will discuss their importance when it comes to our heart health and how to alleviate this risk for those that are modifiable. I'll also talk about what important numbers you should know for heart health and ways to keep your heart healthy. Now, when, when it comes to heart health or heart disease risk, keep in mind, it's not all bad news. The silver lining is that many of the factors associated with a higher risk of heart disease can be reduced or eliminated with the adoption of healthy lifestyle habits. February's Heart Health Month. We just celebrated Valentine's Day. We've seen and heard about hearts everywhere in love songs and in poems. A long time ago, people thought that their emotions came from their heart. Maybe that's because the heart beats faster when a person is scared or excited. Now we know today that emotions come from the brain. And in this case, the brain tells the heart to speed up. So what does the heart do for our body? And what keeps it ticking? And what does it look like? Well, your heart is a muscle, and it's located a little to the left of the middle of your chest, and it's about the size of your fist. There are lots of muscles all over your body, in your arms, your legs, your chest, your back, even in your behind. But the heart muscle is special because of what it does. The heart sends blood around your body. The blood provides, provi the blood provides your body with oxygen and nutrients it needs. It also carries away waste. Your heart is sort of like a pump. Well, two pumps in one. The right side of your heart receives blood from the body and pumps it to the lungs. Now the left side of the heart does the exact opposite. It receives blood from the lungs and pumps it out to the body. Now your heart pumps blood around your body all the time, about five liters or about eight pints of it. This is called circulation. So your heart, blood, and the blood vessels together, they make up your cardiovascular system or your heart and circulatory system. Now there are four chambers that make up the heart, two on the left side and two on the right. The two small upper chambers are called the atria and the two lower, larger lower chambers are called the ventricles. These left and right sides of the heart are separated by a wall of muscle and that's called the septum. Your blood is pumped around your body through a network of blood vessels. The arteries, they carry oxygen-rich blood from your heart to all parts of your body, getting smaller as they get further away from the heart. The capillaries, they connect the smallest arteries to the smallest veins, and they help exchange water, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and other nutrients and waste substances between the blood and the tissues around them. Veins, now they carry blood lacking in oxygen back toward your heart, and they get bigger as they get nearer to your heart. Now blood vessels are able to widen or narrow depending on how much blood each part of your body requires. This action is partly controlled by hormones. Valves. Your heart has four valves, and they act like gates, keeping the blood moving in the right direction. We have the or or uh, aortic valve, which is on the left side, as well as the mitral valve. Both of those are on the left side. And the pulmonary valve and the tricuspid valve, both of those are located on the right side. Now, if you've ever listened to your heartbeat, it makes a lub-dub sound. For blood to travel throughout your body quickly enough, it has to be under pressure. Now, this is created by the relationship between three things, 
your heart's pumping action, the size and stretchiness of your blood vessels, and the thickness of the blood itself. Now, one heartbeat is a single cycle in which your heart contracts and relaxes to pump blood. At rest, the normal heart beats approximately 60 to 100 times every minute. And of course, it increases when you exercise. And to ensure an adequate blood supply around your body, the four chambers of the heart have to pump regularly and in the right sequence. Now, there are two phases of your heart's pumping cycle. The first one is systole. That's when your heart contracts, pushing the blood out of the chambers. Then diastole is the period between contractions when the muscle of your heart or the myocardium relaxes and the chambers fill with blood. When you go for a checkup, your doctor uses a stethoscope. That's to listen to your heart. The heart the he a healthy heart makes the lub-dub sound with each beat. This sound comes from those valves shutting on the blood inside the heart. Now, the first sound, the lub, happens when the mitral and the tricuspid valves close. And the next sound, the dub, happens when the aortic and the pulmonary valves close after the blood has been squeezed out of the heart. Now, when you don't have a stethoscope on hand to listen to your, to your heart inside your chest, you can check how it's working from the outside of your body, through your pulse. Now, two good places to find it are on the side of your neck. So to feel this, slide two fingers into the groove to the left or right of the trachea. This is the carotid artery. You'll feel the pulse there. You can also find your pulse inside your wrist, just below your thumb. Blood pressure. So when you get your blood pressure checked by your doctor or perhaps you're taking it yourself at home, the result is written in with a top number, that's called the systolic number, that's when the heart is contracting, and a bottom number, which is the diastolic number, that's when the heart is resting between beats. Now this diagram shows the relationship of compressing the artery with an inflatable cuff to produce an arterial pressure reading. In this example, it shows a reading of 120 over 80. So you look at A, that's when the cuff is inflated so that it stops any arterial blood flow. No sound can be heard through the stethoscope. B, that's when the valve is uh, in the inflatable cuff is slowly released. And the first sound that is heard is created from the pulsing blood, th blood flow through the compressed artery. So that number displayed on the gauge when the first sound is heard, that's the systolic pressure. In this example, the sound starts at 120. C, the number displayed on the gauge when the sound disappears and it becomes silent, that's your diastolic pressure. Again, in this example, the sound stops at 80. Now your health, your family history, your genetics and your lifestyle behaviors can influence how efficient your heart functions. So what do the blood pressure numbers mean? Well, high blood pressure increases the heart's workload, causing the heart muscle to thicken and become stiffer. This stiffening of the heart muscle is not normal and causes the heart to function abnormally. Normal blood pressure is less than 120 and less than 80. Now, blood pressure outside of the normal levels are characterized or categorized in stages. Elevated. Elevated blood pressure is when readings consistently, and you have to remember, in order to be diagnosed with high blood pressure, you will have to have readings that are consistently above the normal range. So when it's elevated, when the readings are consistently above, one from 120 to 129 systolic and less than 80 millimeters of mercury, that's your diastolic. Now, people with elevated blood pressure are likely to develop high blood pressure unless steps are taken to control the condition. Now, hypertension stage one is when the blood pressure, again, consistently ranges from 130 to 139 systolic or 80 to 89 diastolic. At this stage of high blood pressure, doctors are likely to prescribe lifestyle changes and may consider adding blood pressure medication based on your risk of cardiovascular disease, such as heart attack or stroke. 
Hypertension stage two is when the blood pressure consistently ranges at 140 over 90 or higher. At this stage of high blood pressure, doctors are likely to prescribe a combination of blood pressure medications and lifestyle changes. Now, a hypertensive crisis, this stage of high blood pressure requires medical attention. If your blood pressure readings suddenly exceed 180 over 120, wait five minutes, then test your blood pressure again. If your readings are still unusually high, contact your doctor immediately. You could be experiencing what we call hypertensive crisis. If your blood pressure is higher than 180 over 120 and you are experiencing signs of possible organ damage, such as chest pain, shortness of breath, back pain, numbness or weakness, change in vision, or difficulty speaking, do not wait to see if your blood pressure comes down. It's time to call 911. Here's a question for you. Go ahead and type your answers into the chat box. Is this a myth or a fact? Your heart stops beating when a heart attack strikes. What do you think? Myth or fact? Your heart stops beating when a heart attack strikes. If you typed in myth, you're correct. During a heart attack, the heart almost always is still beating, but the blood supply to it is blocked. So as a result, it doesn't get enough oxygen and that can injure the heart. Now, when your heart suddenly stops beating, that's called cardiac arrest. Now, a heart attack can lead to cardiac arrest. However, they are two different things. Unfortunately, this is still a, st a sad statistic today. According to the Centers of, for, of, for Disease Control and Prevention, it's estimated one in four deaths in the United States is due to heart disease. And you do remember this, it is the number one killer for both men and women. Now, heart disease is an umbrella term, meaning it describes many conditions that affect a person's heart health. Heart disease describes conditions that affect a person's heart muscle, heart valves, the coronary arteries, or the heart rhythm. Each of these components plays an important part in a person's overall heart health. Now, early heart disease often doesn't have symptoms or symptoms may be barely noticeable. That's why regular checkups with your doctor are so important. Contact your doctor right away if you feel you have any chest pain, pressure or discomfort. However, chest pain is a less common sign of heart disease as it progresses. So be aware of other symptoms. Angina, this is the medical term for chest pain. This occurs when the heart muscle doesn't get enough oxygen. The result is a feeling of squeezing or pressure in the chest. Now, there's different types of angina exist. The most common types are called stable, and unstable angina. Now with stable angina, this is also known as angina with physical exertion. And that's because exercise and exertion increases the body's requirements for oxygen. And the heart muscle can suffer. On a personal note, I do remember my dad, he was in his 80s and he would have some chest discomfort while he was, was mowing the lawn. So that's an example of stable angina. Unstable angina is more concerning because it's chest pain that occurs unrelated to exertion. A heart attack occurs when the coronary arteries narrow so much that they cut off the blood supply to the heart. Now, often this is a result of cholesterol buildup in the arteries called atherosclerosis. A piece of this cholesterol can break off and block the blood vessel. Now, the heart cells begin to die, and as they're deprived of oxygen, symptoms include shortness of breath and severe chest pain that may radiate to the back, the jaw, or the left arm. However, women may experience different symptoms associated with heart attack and heart disease. I'll explain that further shortly. A stroke. Now, when the heart isn't working effectively, blood clots are more likely to form in the blood vessels. Now, a stroke occurs when one of these clots lodges 
in a blood vessel in the brain. That's called an ischemic stroke. Or a blood vessel bursts in the brain and cuts off the blood flow. That's called hemorrhagic. Now, ischemic stroke is the more common type of stroke and has the following symptom. Numbness on one side of the body, confusion, trouble speaking, loss of balance or coordination. Now, if a person doesn't seek treatment quickly enough, too many brain cells may die in important areas of the brain that control things like speech, strength, memory. If a person does live through the stroke, these elements of brain function may never return, or it may take time and rehabilitation to recover. Now, on a personal note, strokes are happening in younger and younger individuals. I have a friend whose husband had a stroke while he was at work. He had a really bad headache during a meeting. He lost consciousness and was rushed to the hospital. He survived. However, he is permanently disabled. It's important to know the signs of a stroke because you only have four and a half hours from the last time the person was normal to get that clot-busting medication. After that, the damage is permanent. So there's an acronym, FAST. F is for face drooping, A is for arm weakness, S is for speech difficulty, and T, time to call 911. F-A-S-T, those are the signs of a stroke. Heart failure. Now, heart failure occurs when the heart cannot adequately pump the blood throughout the body. The heart muscle is very strong. However, over time, the muscle can be affected and have trouble doing its job. The heart starts to compensate by being faster, building up more muscle or stretching to accommodate more blood. Over time, these methods of compensating can affect the heart's function and result in heart failure. This can cause shortness of breath, dizziness, confusion, and buildup of fluid in the body causing swelling. High blood pressure, also called hypertension, means that the pressure in your arteries is consistently above the normal range. A blood pressure is the force of the blood pushing against the blood vessel walls. The danger is that you usually can't tell if you have high blood pressure. That's why it's called a silent killer. There are no symptoms. That's why it's so important to have it checked. And also, no one knows exactly what causes it, yet high blood pressure can lead to hardening of the arteries, stroke, or heart attack. Now, men and women have di- can have different symptoms related to their heart disease because they are more likely to have different parts of the heart affected. For example, women most commonly develop heart disease in the smaller arteries that branch off the heart's major or coronary arteries. As a result, women may experience different symptoms related to their heart disease, including nausea, shortness of breath, vomiting, or stomach pain. Men are more likely to experience heart disease that affects or blocks the major coronary arteries. So this can cause the symptoms that people most commonly associate with heart disease, such as crushing chest pain, tightness, or pressure in the chest, particularly with stress or physical activity. So what about risks? Now, there are some risk factors that you can and also cannot control. So be sure to talk to with your doctor about your specific health concerns. Risk factors that you can can control are called modifiable risk factors, and these include smoking. The risk that smokers will develop coronary heart disease is much higher than that for non-smokers. And cigarette smoking is a powerful independent risk factor for sudden cardiac death in patients who already have coronary heart disease. Now, cigarette smoking also interacts with the other risk factors to greatly increase the risk for coronary heart disease. Exposure to other people's smoke increases the risk of heart disease, even for non-smokers. Now, the other modifiable risk factors include high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, being overweight, lack of exercise, stress, and metabolic syndrome. That is a combination of three risk factors. Now, the risk factors you cannot control include, of course, your age. The majority of people who die of coronary heart disease are 65 or older. 
your family history. Now, children of parents with heart disease are more likely to develop heart disease themselves. African Americans are, have more severe high blood pressure than Caucasians and higher risks of heart disease. Now, heart disease risk is also higher among Mexican Americans, American Indians, Native Hawaiians, and some Asian Americans. And this is partly due to higher rates of obesity and diabetes. So most people with a significant family history of heart disease have one or more other risk factors. Just as you can't control your age, sex, and race, you can't control your family history. So it's even more important to treat and control those any other modifiable, modifiable risk factors that you have. Gender. Men have a greater risk of heart attack than women do, and men have heart attacks earlier in life. Even after women reach the age of menopause, when women's death rate from heart disease increases, women's risk for heart attack is less that than that for men. However, do keep in mind, this is the number one killer of both men and women. People with diabetes have an elevated risk of heart disease. So if you already have been diagnosed with, pre, diagnosed with pre-diabetes or diabetes, making diet, exercise, and lifestyle changes can dramatically improve to reduce your risk of heart disease. You can see these sobering statistics related to the heart disease risk coronary stents, heart attacks, uh, heart disease morbidity and mortality, as well as the chance of dying from heart disease. So when it comes to heart health, what numbers are important? Now I'm gonna review what the values are for these numbers on the next slide. You should know your resting heart rate. This is your pulse. You should also know your total cholesterol as well as the LDL. That's the bad cholesterol. You should also know your body mass index, how tall you are and your weight. Sometimes there's a chart where you can see, you can slide your finger over to how tall you are and what your weight is to come up with your, the figure that is your body mass index. You should know your blood pressure. Also your blood sugar. This can be measured by the amount of glycosylated hemoglobin in your blood. We call that sometimes hemoglobin A1C or HbA1C. This is a test that gives you a picture of your average blood sugar control over the past two or three months. And for those with diabetes, it really provides a much better idea of how well your diabetes treatment plan is working. You should also know your waist circumference. There's a correlation between your body mass index and your waist circumference. Both of those are, provide good indicators of whether you are at a healthy weight. Sleep is also very important for heart health. So what number should we aim for? Well, on your resting heart rate, now this is a function of how efficient your heart is at pumping blood to the body. Now, most people will have a resting heart rate between 60 and 100. Although a lower resting heart rate implies more efficient heart function and better cardiovascular fitness, most literature still does state that between 60 and 100 beats per minute for a normal resting heart rate. Cholesterol. You know there's two types of cholesterol. There's the LDL, which is the bad, and then there's the HDL, which is the good. So too much of the bad kind and not enough of the good kind increases your risk that cholesterol will slowly build up in the inner walls of the arteries that feed the heart and the brain. Now, cholesterol can join with other substances to form a thick, hard deposit on the inside of the arteries. This can narrow the arteries and make them less flexible. So a normal total cholesterol is less than 200 to milligrams per deciliter. And the bad, you want that bad cholesterol less than 100 milligrams for, um, per deciliter. Now on the body mass index, between 18.25 and 24.9. However, a person's ideal body weight varies by gender, age, height, and frame. On the hemoglobin A1C, a normal reading is between 4% and 5.6%. Now on the waist circumference, fat in the belly doesn't just sit there taking up space. It pumps out chemicals like cytokines that trigger 
chronic inflammation throughout the body. That's a problem because chronic inflammation is thought to be one of the major factors linking obesity to various conditions, including heart disease. So your waist circumference for, uh, for men should be less than 40 inches and for women, less than 35 inches. Sleep. Most adults need seven hours of sleep each night. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. It's really important for you to know your numbers. So through home monitoring and regular visits with your healthcare provider, you can keep track of your blood sugar, blood pressure, cholesterol, and weight. Remember, knowledge is power. You need to learn your numbers. The heart health and sleep. Now, a third of Americans say they don't get enough recommended sleep, which is seven to eight hours. Sleep seems to be that one area of our lives we feel we can skimp on. However, lack of sleep can affect your heart. High blood pressure. So during normal sleep, your blood pressure goes down. So if you're having sleep problems or you're not getting enough sleep, that means your blood pressure stays higher for a longer amount of time. Obesity, the lack of sleep can lead to unhealthy weight gain. So not getting enough sleep may affect a part of the brain that controls hunger. And what happens is it increases the hunger hormone and it decreases the hormone that makes us feel full. So if you are not getting enough sleep, your hormones can be off and you are hungry. Type 2 diabetes. Now, some studies are showing that the getting enough sleep may help people improve their blood sugar control. So how can we keep our heart healthy? Well, when you eat a heart-healthy diet, you can prevent or reverse heart disease. With so much conflicting information out there, how do you know what you know, healthy eating really looks like? Well, it's a balance of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, lentils, poultry, and fish. Here comes another question, myth or fact. You can lower your risk of heart disease with vitamins and supplements. What do you think that is? Is that a myth or is that a fact? Well, if you said myth, you are correct. The antioxidant vitamins E, C, and beta carotene factor into lowering heart disease risk. However, clinical trials of supplementation with these vitamins have either failed to confirm a benefit or were conducted in, in such a way that no conclusion could be drawn. So the American Heart Association has stated that there is no scientific evidence to justify using these vitamins to prevent or treat cardiovascular disease. However, for reasons not understood, the body absorbs and utilizes vitamins and minerals best when they are acquired through food. To ensure you get the vitamins and minerals you need, skip the store-bought supplements and eat a wide variety of nutritious foods of every color of the rainbow. The more colors, the better. We are so lucky to have the availability all year round of fresh fruits and vegetables. And when it comes to whole grains, check the nutrition label to make sure it's a whole grain product. Don't be fooled by products that say they are multi-grain and for those that have added sugar. Here comes your next question. Fiber can lower your cholesterol. Is that a myth or is that a fact? Type in your answer. If you selected fat, that is correct. It lowers your bad cholesterol and may prevent heart disease. Now, fiber comes from plants, things like whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans. Think of things like oatmeal or oat bran, Brussels sprouts, apples, pears, berries, kidney beans. More and more articles suggest substituting meat with fish, poultry, or plant-based protein because it can lower your risk of heart disease and death. 
In general, red meats, things like beef, pork, lamb, have more saturated or bad fat than chicken, fish, and vegetable proteins, such as beans. Now, saturated and trans fat, those can raise your blood cholesterol and make heart disease worse. And the American Heart Association says that eating at least two 3.5 ounce servings of fish per week. Think of a checkbook. That's what a serving of fish would be, like it's the size of a checkbook. Things like salmon, mackerel, herring, lake trout, sardines, and albacore tuna. These can help beat heart disease and heart attack. Now, nuts and seeds, they're rich in vegetable oils, which means that they can add up. The calories can add up quickly. So you just need to watch out for the portions. Portion sizing is key when it comes to nuts and seeds. Now, if you like meat, you can still reduce your risk of heart disease as long as you limit the amount and choose healthier types. Know what the portion size of a serving of um, meat is. It's like the, a deck of cards or the palm of your hand. So know the appropriate portion size. Choose lean meats. Trim off that visible fat. Choose healthy cooking methods such as grilling, baking, broiling. Now, minimize those processed meats. You can have these occasionally, just not all the time. Here's our next question. Myth or fact? If you have heart disease, you should eat as little fat as possible. This might be a little tricky one. What do you think the answer is to that? It's a myth. It's true that you should eat a diet low in saturated fat, partially hydrogenated fat, and trans fat. But other fats, notably the unsaturated fats that we'll find in vegetable oils and other foods are beneficial. In fact, eating fish high in omega-3 fatty acids such as salmon twice a week can lower the risk of heart disease. So always make sure to include low-fat dairy products, fatty fishes, nuts, things like olive oil in your diet. If you eat meat, make sure that the cuts are lean and remove skin from any of your poultry. All right, on this side, on this slide, love it. Now, these are going to be your unsaturated um, fats. This is going to be poly and mono. Make friends with those guys. They are liquid at room temperature. Things like olive oil, avocados, those plant-based um, plant oils. These things lower your rates of cardiovascular disease. They also lower the bad cholesterol and the triglyceride level. Triglyceride is another fat in the blood. Now, they also provide essential fats that your body needs but can't produce itself. In the middle here, where you want to limit these guys, this is the saturated fat or full fat dairy, butter, and cheese. These tend to increase your, cardiovas your risk for cardiovascular cardiovascular disease, and it also raises the bad cholesterol level. The lose it side, oh my gosh, these are the artificial trans fats, the hydrogenated oils and tropical oils. These are going to be in the foods that we like to eat, those baked goods, those pastries, the cakes, the cookies, those fried foods. Unfortunately, these increase your risk of heart disease as well as raise your bad cholesterol levels. Here comes your next question, myth or fact. Your heart needs one straight hour of exercise every day. Is that a myth or is that a fact? It's actually a myth. Physical activity is key. Don't get me wrong on that. But you don't have to carve out a one solid hour daily to do it. As long as you can get at least 30 minutes of moderate activity, things like gardening, walking, yoga, leisurely bike ride, most days of the week or you can do at least 25 minutes of a harder type of activity, like running, swimming, or basketball, three days a week. And you can even break this up into 10 or 15 minutes here and there, whatever works best for you. So the current physical activity guidelines for adults include getting at least 150 minutes per week. Um, that's um, 30 minutes a day times five days. And this is a moderate intensity aerobic activity or 75 minutes per week of this vigorous aerobic activity or a combination of both. You know, preferably you should spread that out throughout the week. You can add moderate to high intensity muscle strengthening activities 
such as resistance or weights, resistant bands or, or weights, at least two days a week. We need to spend less time sitting. So even light intensity activity can offset some of the risks of being sedentary. Gain even more benefits by being active at least 300 minutes per week. That's five hours. So instead of 30 minutes, that's an hour, almost an hour a day, um, five, five hours per week. Increase the amount and the intensity gradually over time. Now, physical activity is anything that moves your body and burns those calories. This includes things like walking or climbing the stairs or stretching. Now, aerobic or cardio activity gets your heart up rate up and benefits your heart by improving your cardio respiratory fitness. When done at moderate intensity, your heart will be faster and you'll breathe harder than normal, but you'll still be able to talk. So think of it as sort of a medium to moderate amount of effort. You can see on the right side there some examples of moderate intensity aerobic activity. Now, vigorous intensity activities will push your body a little further. They will require a higher amount of effort. You'll probably get warm and begin to sweat, and you won't be able to talk as much without getting out of breath. You can see the examples of the vigorous intensity aerobic activities there on the right as well. Myth or fact, emotions affect your risk for heart disease. Is that a myth or a fact? What do you think about that one? If you said fact, you are correct. Research shows a link between heart disease and high levels of stress and hostility. Stress increases hormone levels and it puts a higher demand on the heart. Now, while there's more research is needed to determine exactly how stress contributes to heart disease, we know that high stress levels can cause us to resort to unhealthy ways of managing that stress. Some of us may choose to consume alcohol or cigarettes when feeling chronic stress. However, these habits increase your blood pressure and may damage artery walls. Stress also causes your body to reduce, release adrenaline. That's a hormone that temporarily causes your breathing and your heart rate to speed up and your blood pressure to rise. You may also make unhealthy choices when it comes to eating. We may try to fill that void or that anxiety or that stress with food. And a lot of times when we're really stressed, we don't really feel like exercising. What about sleep? So what can you do to get better sleep? Well, stick to a regular sleep schedule. Go to bed the same time each night and get up the same time each morning. That includes the weekends. Get enough natural light, especially early in the day. So try going for a morning or a lunchtime walk. Try to avoid that artificial light, especially a few hours before bedtime. Use a blue light filter on your computer or your smartphone. You know, the light from those devices, it wakes the brain up. And so you won't feel sleepy. Now, don't eat or drink within a few hours of bedtime, especially alcohol or foods that are high in fat and sugar. That wrecks the blood sugar levels. They're going up and down through the night, and it really wrecks havoc on, uh, on your sleep, being able to sleep. Alcohol, same thing. It may make you feel sleepy. However, it robs you of the REM sleep, that deep restorative sleep. Keep your bedroom cool, dark, and quiet. Now, if sleep or lack of it is an issue for you, work with your healthcare team to identify those obstacles to good sleep, including maybe there are some other medical conditions going on. If your doctor has instructed you to lose some weight, it's likely for a good reason. Excess weight means your heart has to work harder to circulate blood throughout your body, which also means that your blood pressure will increase. It may add more pressure on your knees, contributing to discomfort and causing you to be less active. And it also may prevent your lungs from fully expanding and cause more fat to build up around your liver, and it could lead to obesity. Now, research saying even losing 10% of your body weight can greatly improve your heart and vascular health, boost your heart function, lower the blood pressure, and improve metabolism. For some folks, that may just be 15 or 20 pounds. Now, those who have successfully maintained a weight loss, well, how did they do it? Well, 98% of them modified their eating habits 
and 94% increase their physical activity. Also, you should understand how much and why you eat. Consider using a food diary or a tracking app to understand what you're eating, how much of it, and when you're eating. Be mindful of your eating habits and aware of your roadblocks and possible excuses that help you can, so that you can, get to the, you can get real about your goals. Now, sometimes we're just not aware of what a true portion looks like, you know, or that, you know, what, when we're eating. Sometimes we're eating, but really we're just thirsty or maybe we're tired or we're bored or we're stressed. Set realistic goals, so know where you are today, so you know how to get where you want to be. So learn what your body mass index is, so you want to set yourself up for success with a short-term goal, something like, I will make lifestyle changes, which will help me lose and keep off 3 to 5% of my body weight. Short-term goals seem much more achievable and keep you on track toward your long-term goals. Manage the portion sizes. It's so easy to overeat when you're served too much food. Smaller portions can help prevent you from overeating. Making smart choices. You don't have to give up all your favorite foods. Learn to make smart food choices and simple substitutions instead. Discover healthy snacks and how fruits, vegetables, and whole grains keep you feeling fuller longer. Less sitting and more moving. Look for opportunities in your day to add activity. So this is what how your body starts to recover after you quit smoking. In the first 20 minutes, your blood pressure and your heart rate recover from those nicotine-induced spikes. After 48 hour, those, or hours, those damaged nerve endings start to regenerate. After two weeks, between two weeks and three months, your circulation and lung function begin to improve. <clears throat> after one year, your risk of coronary heart disease is reduced by 50%. After five years, the risk of heart disease is that of a non-smoker. Now, smoking is the most preventable cause of death in the United States. Almost one-third of the deaths from coronary heart disease are due to smoking and secondhand smoke. Smoking is linked to about 90% of lung cancers in the United States. Smoking rates overall are down, but too many adults still smoke or vape or use other forms of tobacco, especially between the ages of 21 and 34. Here is your call to action. So what can you do today to maintain or improve your heart health? Well, talk with your doctor. If it's been a while, schedule a checkup focused on heart health. Your healthcare team can help you reduce your risk of heart disease or stroke so that you can live a longer, healthier life. Work together on your prevention plan. Ask questions and be open about any challenges you may face in trying to make healthy changes. Know your numbers. Although your doctor can test for your blood pressure and your cholesterol annual checkups, it's important that you know and understand what the numbers mean. Spend less time sitting and more time moving. Practice a combination of aerobic, strengthening, and stretching activities most days of the week. It keeps the heart and the lungs healthy while boosting your metabolism. And if you're carrying some excess weight, try to see if you can lose that body fat, especially if it's around the belly. Find ways to manage stress. Try to get enough sleep in. And of course, stop smoking. If you smoke, quitting is the best thing you can do for your health. Now, if you have a health condition and your doctor may prescribe statins or other medications, to help control cholesterol or your blood sugar or your blood pressure, all three. Take all medications as directed, but don't take aspirin as a preventative measure unless your doctor tells you to. If you have never had a heart attack or a stroke, a daily aspirin may not help you at all, and it could cause problems including the risk of bleeding. Now, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your doctor may want you to take a low-dose aspirin to reduce your risk of having another one. These last couple of slides are on programs that we offer for our HealthNet members. Our members can find lots of wellness information and resources when you log on to your HealthNet account. It's also a perfect time to take your health risk questionnaire. Takes about 20 minutes. 
and don't forget to discuss the results with your doctor. Also, we offer the Quit for Life Tobacco Cessation Program. We offer that for our members and for our Medicare members, they have access to the Teladoc Tobacco Cessation Program. This is if you need assistance in quitting tobacco. Also, tackling new health goals, they, that can be challenging. But you know what? You don't have to face it alone. A health coach can help you prioritize your goals, strategize a plan. They support you through your journey. You work one-on-one -on -one with the same health coach. They help you tackle those bumps on the road. If you have a health concern, our members can call our nurse advice line anytime, day or night. Now, my strength, this is our self-help mental health program. We call it a health club for your mind. Health Net members can browse, browse through the top topics um, that help best fit your mood. They have modules on lots of different programs or topics. You see some of them listed here, anxiety, depression, pain management, sleep. They even have a COVID-19 module. So My Strength is available to Health Net members via the web or it's also as a mobile app. And you can see there on the bottom of the screen how you can register for that. It's a complimentary program for Health Net members. We also offer discounts for our members. So you can get discounts on weight management programs such as Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig. You can receive complimentary care like massage therapy. And of course, a discount on the memberships of our network of gyms, all which have on-demand programming. Now, if you're not a Health Net member, please check with your health benefits provider for similar programs and discounts. Last but not least, please join us next month, March. Um, we'll have our webinar called Whole Person Self-Care and Resilience. 2020 was quite a challenging year, and we're all hoping that 2021 is going to be better. Now, during this webinar, you will learn about resilience, self-care, why it's important, you learn about mindfulness and meditation. Learning these useful techniques will help you stay strong and move forward in 2021. I hope you will plan to join us next month. Thank you again for your time today. It was a pleasure to have you here, and we hope that you will join, uh, join us next month. You are free to uh, exit the, the webinar conference call. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.